my dean is a beautiful dean. My, I believe this. My dean has told me to be good to my neighbor. My dean has told me to be a good national citizen in the societies I'm in. My dean tells me to be a good son, a good teacher, a good Muslim. There's no reason why my dean does not have the ability to tell me how to not do my politics. Well. We have a rich history of that. And I don't feel to some degree, you know, I don't have a complex because of that. I'm comfortable with that. But if you were to tell me, is the Khilafah going to happen tomorrow? Then right now, my answer would be no. Dr. Yakub Ahmed, I've invited you onto the Thinking Muslim podcast for a special episode commemorating 99 years of the fall of the Ottoman Caliphate. Now, the Ottoman Caliphate, the world's last widely recognized caliphate, was abolished on the 3rd of March 1924, corresponding to the 27th of Rajab, 1342 after Hijri, by the decree of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. The process was one of Ataturk's reforms following the replacement of the Ottoman Empire with the Republic of Turkey. Abdul Majid II was deposed as the last Ottoman Caliph, as was Mustafa Sabri as the last Ottoman Sheikh al Islam. I want to explore the circumstances that led to this momentous event, why the Ottoman Caliphate fell, what this date should mean to us all, and the impact this decision had on Muslims at the time and has on Muslims today. Now, for the sake of our new subscribers, Dr. Yakub Ahmed is a great friend of this show, although he has recently been moonlighting by attending other podcasts, I hear, Yakub. <laughs> Yakub holds a PhD graduate, he's a PhD graduate from SOAS, uh, University of London, an Ottoman historian. He's currently teaching Islamic history at Istanbul University and was a visiting fellow at the Modern Turkish Studies Center at Istanbul Şehir University. His research focuses are, are on Muslim intellectual thought in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, Islamic constitutionalism, identity, nationalism, and collective memory construction. Dr. Yakub Ahmed, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome back Alex, to the Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Thanks for having me again. It's it wonderful feels just for like you yesterday. to be with us. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand you're currently in the United I States the, uh, on a I tour. Am, yeah, tell us a bit about I that. I am in the U.S. of A. That's, that is right. Yeah. So, um, this was an interesting one. Um, so I've been reluctant to come here. Um, I've been living in Turkey now quite comfortable. The last time I came to the US was 22 years ago. And that was for family mm -hmm. reasons. Um, and I was, I was teaching an on online class. So um, from time to time, sporadically, um, there's a demand for people who want to do Ottoman history online. Um, and I don't mind teaching that. So I had an on cl online class. And... Um, Two of the students from the U.S., um, great guys, um, they were just insisting that I, firstly, they insisted that I do something more often on online um, so that, because there's a there's market out there. One of the things that Zoom has done, although it's created a sense of Zoom fatigue when you're teaching at university, um, internationally, it's given people around the world access to scholars. So there is a uniqueness in that sense. Um, and that class was was really eclectic for people from Malaysia, people from the UK, the US, Saudi Arabia, you, you name it, they want it. Anyway, these, these two brothers, uh, mashallah, Malik, I'll be pleased with them. They consistently mm -hmm. insisted that I come to the US because there's people who want to hear what I have to say and so forth. And just like the way you did in terms of twisting my arm, because um, <laughs> as you know, I am reclusive in that sense. Um, I, I sort of had this conversation with one of my students and he, he said to me, like, what are you going to say to Allah? And I was quite flippant and said, well, what am I going to say to Allah? They've got academics in the U.S. They don't need me. And then he goes, look, but maybe you might say something differently, which might be, um, you know, and you go to the U.K. and uh, don't you think it's unfair? Um, and that sort of made me lose a little bit of sleep. So then I, I spoke to them and they have organized everything for me to come out here. And I've just been doing classes in high schools, um, in mosques, madrasas, Islamic institutions. And it's been great for me because forget the exposure. I mean, I'm not one that wants the exposure, but it's a way of um, learning uh, about the dynamics in, in regarding the Muslim community in Chicago, in New, York, New York, and New Jersey, understanding how the schooling system works here in terms of Muslim education, understanding how Muslims 
on the ground feel about Islam, Islamic history. You get in a real sense of, um, you know, speaking to people on the ground, seeing the, the types of activism that takes place outside of the university campus as well as in the university campus. And, and then going to the Islamic seminaries and seeing what they are doing, because as I said before, I've made a consistent argument that we need to introduce history into our curricula. And I think I've got a better understanding of how the, the machine works to, to some degree. And I think going forward, if I can achieve this, I'd like to work with um, both schools in England and in the US as a way of writing a a, a sort of, we spoke about this, a primer for high school initially um, mm -hmm. with teachers to see how we can write something that can be taught in the classroom. And then that can be a mainstay because a lot of schools are saying they want to put Islam from um, Ottoman history, more specifically on the syllabus so that kids can, can, can do that. We ha in England, it is started to become part of the curricula, but the academics who are writing it are still of a Western inclination who are um, closely um, aligned to you know, a, a particular mode of thinking, which I'm not sure is helpful for kids in Islamic schools. So that's been the, the shindig. One of the last times we spoke on this podcast, uh, you discussed how British Muslims tend to ask very similar questions yeah. about the Ottomans. Did you find a very similar uh, series of questions from the yeah. US? Or, I, I, I think yeah. what I've noticed is, is that it's not an issue of being British or American or even being in... I mean, in Turkey, that's, that's unique. But what I've noticed is there is a particular meta-narrative. And um, we, by hook or by crook, have been quite lazy in just embracing that narrative, whatever that meant, you know, and then um, regurgitating some of the misgivings we have, internalize a lot of those points, and, and then take it for a given. And it's only when somebody says, well, actually, that's not what happened. You know, people, what do you mean? That's, that's exactly what happened. And then you say, okay, well, they, they'll say to me, prove it to me. Actually, it's not my job to prove it to you. I'm the historian. I know. Well, you prove it to me. Where did you get your information from? And then you can see they start. And I do that deliberately as a way of just highlighting to them that actually, we've had this conversation before. We shouldn't be, you know, people who are talking about Islamic history or people of the past who are dead, who have no way of defending themselves as if we're having a conversation on a pub on a, you know, Friday afternoon. So... Um, that's been the intention just to highlight how rich our Islamic history is, all warts and all, um, trying to help Muslims navigate it. So one of the points I made here, and I was quite insistent on that, was that you should not allow people tell, to tell you who you are as a Muslim. You should not allow them people to tell you who you were as a Muslim. And as a consequence of that, you should not allow people to tell you who you ought to be. Um, and, and you have to be in control of that day. And we do have a critical methodology that we use. We are critical of our own historical background. And we can critique it in a space which is safe for us, where we can have an open conversation. We do not need to feel a particular type of pressure in terms of what subject areas we should look at and we shouldn't look at. I mean, there's an Im immense type of pressure. And I would assume that with the methodologies of prevent and so forth, that there would be a type of regulation in terms of how we would teach history um, to our kids going forward. And I think that's a problem. And I think that um, going forward, people like myself and other academics and historians and people in mosques and parents and people in school committees need to get together as a way of saying, okay, you know, we have a rich history and how can we make, bring this back to life in a way that's conducive for us? So that's something that that's um, popped up in my mind. I don't think this is a one-man project. I think this is a collective project, but we should have those conversations. Now, I've invited you here today to talk about uh, 99 years since the fall of the Ottoman Caliphate. Today marks, on the 3rd of March, 1924, uh, the last Ottoman Caliph, Abdul Majid II, was deposed. Let's start with the date, the 3rd of March. What does this date symbolize for you? Growing up, it meant absolutely nothing. The, the number didn't make sense to me. It was irrelevant to me. Hmm. Um, hmm. Getting a bit older, what you have, the Islamic political movements in particular, highlighting the, the date in particular as a, as a moment of trauma. Um, as a child, once again, I didn't resonate with the trauma and whatnot. But as a historian, um, once you start studying the history and so forth, and in Turkey, where you have 
So most nation states will have like a moment of um, the birth of the nation, an independence day, maybe a Republican day and so on. And you have these national holidays as a way of celebrating a particular emergence of a new nation. For me as a historian is what I've started to learn is it's intriguing here. We have a date where for some Muslims anyway, this is a, a, a date of, of a more negative disposition. Um, and how living in Turkey, what's conflicting in one degree is on the one hand, you have a narrative amongst Muslims of a particular moment of a collapse of a particular, not only institution in Islam, but also an empire um, that spanned across 600 years and has a rich history. And then on the other hand, you have this strange dichotomy where um, you have a, a celebration of the emergence of a republic, which most Muslims around the world can't quite grasp if they're of a particular, you know, thinking. And that is intriguing for me, um, trying to make sense of that. Um, this sounds a little bit harsh, and maybe I'm being a bit harsh, but there, there, I felt growing up later on in my life, there was a sense of fatigue on the caliphate question um, mm. by just general Muslims and maybe the younger generation in them themselves um, I haven't quite subscribed to the idea in a way that previous generations might have. Um, and that's something that I think the Islamic political groups need to have a look at in terms of, you know, there is a fatigue, I think, and there is a, a nervousness and there is a, a section and a segment in the communities that want to distance themselves from the question. But at the same time, I'm noticing since the emergence of Daesh and the collapse of Daesh, that there has been a, a sort of resurgence of people asking the question as well, um, especially in the Muslim world. And um, even in academic spaces. Um, uh, and I found that interesting as an outside observer who was, you know, reading about this, the question, but how, so, you know, you have this idea of the historical caliphate and now we're having a, the question of the imagination of a possible one and how does that make sense? And I think that's interesting for me because I've always said history is not about the past necessarily, it's also about the present, right? It's the type of questions you ask now is reflective of what it is you want to know about the past. The fact that I'm noticing more and more people talking about this now in various spaces and articulating it differently and possibly articulating it in a way outside of this framework of activism, but more in terms of depth beyond the symbolism, beyond the rhetoric, and trying to provide a particular sort of like um, outlook in which it can make sense in today's reality is interesting because I think many of us still talk about the historical caliphate. We haven't been able to mm. fashion something which can make sense to people right now. Maybe that's a conversation that better thinkers than me need to talk about. Well, how much is the Ottoman caliphate a model for uh, the way we should think about future caliphates? I mean, I note that uh, those political groups that you yeah. talk of, you know, whether that's Hezbo Tahrir or Tanzimi Islami or Jamaati Islami, uh, or the very many uh, local groups that yeah. exist outside of Turkey, uh, these groups tend to not focus on Ottoman history very much and tend to go back either to the time of the Prophet Ali Salatu Islam or to the earlier caliphates of the Abbasids or even the Umayyads. How important is uh, uh, understanding the Ottomans for future uh, construction of, of I think you know my opinion on this in the sense that I don't just say this as an Ottoman historian. Um, I, I just feel that to have a 600-year blind spot and then a 400-year mm. blind spot in not trying to understand the, the discursive evolution of an institution which did exist in a, in a lifetime where there's just two generations or three generations outside of of ours is, is intriguing for me. Um, when we look at Daesh in particular, let's look at Daesh and let's examine that one for a second, which is that yeah. these are probably people who have, um, had been indoctrinated by a particular form of Arab nationalism, who subscribed to a particular idea of Islam in response to the United States of America. And then because of that idea of Arab nationalism, two key components, they're not the only ones, but two key components could stick come out in my mind. One was when uh, al-Baghdadi was fashioning himself as an Abbasid caliph, trying to create an mm. imagination of being dressed like an Abbasid caliph. And actually, I'm not even sure the Abbasid caliphs dressed like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But he, anyway, he chose to wear a black turban, black robe, and a Rolex watch. And then you had the ideal Sykes and Pico, 
which was very strong in the mind. And this was intriguing, which was like, how do you, how, how do you make sense of that? That there is a, a huge chunk of the imagination which is missing. And as a result, you can clearly see that the reflection of that imagination in the way that they sort of like imagined this idea. What was interesting about them though, and I said this before, is that Muslims, you would have assumed, or one would have assumed at that time, and including myself, that Muslims would have said, I'm done with the caliphate question. I'm out. This is, this is not for our, this yeah. type of collateral damage is not what we're asking. And, and, and we don't want anything to do with our politics being informed by Islam, the moral and ethics of Islam. Instead, what we want is just to abide by whatever nations we live in and, and live in accordance to Islam being a religion. But that's not what they said. Instead, mm. a lot of people started asking the question of what is a caliphate and many turned around and said, that's not what it was. So it's intriguing mm -hmm. here. I mean, okay, they might say that's not what it was in comparison to the Khulafat al-Shudun maybe, but that's not what I was seeing. I, I, I think that's where I became lucky as an Ottoman historian. It wasn't just Diderish al -Turul. It was this phenomenon where people wanted to know more because they realized um, that they didn't know. And in some mm -hmm. degree, why Diderish al -Turul became interesting was that you saw that Muslims were looking up to a particular style of leadership. They, they looked at Irrespective of whether Dillage was historically a caliph or not, or whether the show is real or not, it's the idea that they wanted somebody who was upright, who was moral, who was honest, who was strong, who was religious. And that's what they're looking for in their politics. And people may deny them and say, you know, we're not interested in the caliphate question. But the mass, tacitly at least, via emotion, was saying something else, whether they knew it or not, right? And I found that interesting. And that for me is them you know, making me look at it and saying, okay, there is still something in the mass. And I don't think it can be easily extracted from them because it's too deeply ingrained across the board, across many generations and many societies. And it's, there's, there's so much literature on this that um, it'll be impossible to, to, to sort of like suppress. Yeah. I want to understand the period uh, before the fall of the last caliph and I want to appreciate why the last caliph was deposed. What were the political, economic right. even, and social circumstances right. behind uh, his deposition, his, his fall? Now, I understand that Caliph Abdul Majid II was appointed in 1922. Mm -hmm. And by then, he was stripped of his legislative powers by the National Assembly, which was dominated by nationalists. Yeah. Um, as part of that discussion, I read very often that the caliphate was separated from the sultanate. Right. And I've never really understood the significance of that. What is the, what's the significance of separating these two institutions? It's a, it's a good question once again, because I think many of us, when we use the word sultanate, we use it in a way where we, we just internalize it as being a form. It's, it's just monarchy. But actually in Islam, mm. this is why I've made the argument cons consistently that the word Islamic state in English is not helpful because it doesn't explain the sort of like hierarchies of political configurations we have in Islam, whether it's a wizara, whether it's a imara, whether it's a sultanat, whether it's a hilafa, and so on. And here what you see is that we see by the Abbasid period in particular, a, a particular style of governance, which is dynastic, which is the sultanate system. Um, and the idea of that fundamentally is even though some people might be critical, but I sort of understand the idea that at the time in which this system emerges is a time of which continuity is necessary, in which you don't have a mechanism in which you can have elections, mass elections around the, the domains of the Muslim world or the domains of the authority of the one in charge. And so you have a mechanism in which society or the elites in society have accepted that authority will belong in this one household and we will maintain a level of continuity as a way of maintaining a sense of continuity of the state mechanism because this is a violent world we live in. And in that sense, you have the emergence of these dynasties, multiple dynasties that, that come about. Um, and, and you will see dynasties like the Seljuks, the Mamluks and so forth. Some of them survived longer than others. But the reason why the Sultanate question I'm going through this long with the way becomes interesting it's because under the Mamluks, especially after the fall of the Abbasid Caliphate after the Mongol invasion in 1258, when the Mamluks become the sort of like vanguards of the protection of the Caliphate, you have a Caliph and then you have the Mamluk Sultanate, which is independent in that sense. So there's a separation here. And so what it indicates is that you have a dynastic authority 
which is de facto ruling um, or is in charge, but you have a symbolic authority that um, still has to be adhered to. And it's a particular hierarchy as a stopgap in many ways that's emerged. Prior to that, you, you have, what's interesting, this is why you have people like Ghazali and, and Joanne and so forth talking about the possibility of am amalgamating the two institutions. Because there was a moment where those institutions were quite se separate. And so the, the nervousness is from the Abbasid period in, initially, prior to the Mongol yeah. invasion, is that the Seljuks would gazump them and swallow them up. And so, um, you know, you, you start to see a host of literature in regards to that. But then when Selim comes down to, to defeat the Mamluks, and the Mamluks have been defeated, he has an option, which is a person in charge of a multi-ethnic, free continent-wide empire. And you can have a nominal figure um, of the Abbasids in Istanbul. And that would undermine his authority in the way that he did things. So he amalgamated the Sultanate with the Khilaf. Now, what's interesting here is there are particular mechanisms of what it meant to belong to the dynasty and particular rules and traditions and cultures about what that dynasty did. And then once it becomes a Khilaf, uh, there are particular historical, traditional, and theological components of upholding that office. So, for example, the Bayt al-Mal, uh, the distribution of Zakat, the Hajj, and so on, right? And, and the manner of the um, implementation of the Sharia and so forth. And so that amalgamation meant that the, the office of the Sultanate, de facto, which was the way that politics was done, was now, um, was now sort of like under the framework of a Khilafah, but it still provides a possibility or the argument that can be made is that the Khilafah does not necessarily have to sit within the Sultanate system. You can sit independent from it. And so what you could have had is something similar to the Mamluks. Now, fast forward, 1922, we have a similar style of situation in which we have a Turkish Republic, which is um, being run at the time by a particular group of military men. And you have a caliph who's independent from that. Once again, his authority is limited. Um, and the, the, the everyday running of the nation was done by those military men. But he had some sort of authority over them, and he had some symbolic authority of Muslim adherence to Istanbul as the center. And so what that does is it mm. creates a particular imagination, and it, it lends to the argument that the institution still needs to exist, um, even, if it is in, even if it's in its weak form, because it still has a particular function beyond just the everyday you know, executive running that take place. Um, now, there were arguments that the Sultanate should not be separated from the, from the Khilafah. And there were arguments that the Khilafah does not have to be part of the Sultanate, right? The idea where we can have elective Khilafah, we can have a Khalifa that can be voted in by the masses and so forth, and the Sultanate is not necessary. But you have a tradition in the Ottoman Empire that for 400 years, the House of Osman and this particular form of power, this particular form of like dynastic power, um, has created all the, the sort of like cultural, traditional, and just legal mechanisms of how this office works, that to separate it would be a huge, like ripping out, or and a huge reformation to some degree. Um, in that mm -hmm. sense, it was only possible because of World War One. It probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for World War One. Um, but then it was now sitting on very weak foundations. And then it, they were able to do away with that as well. Sorry, that's a bit long-winded, I know. Let, no, I, I understand that. So let's understand then the motivations of these nationalists. Right. Now, we've used the term yeah. nationalists. Who were they? And um, my understanding is that it wasn't just World War I that brought them into ascendancy. I mean, even prior to World War I, they were responsible, for example, in 1908 uh, in removing... Uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid from office. So who were these people and what were their ultimate motivations? Because in the back of my mind, I think these people were, you know, anti-Islam or at least had a had a view that Islam should have no part to play in political affairs. Is that how we can characterize this group of nationalists? I think that's a bit of a reduction. Actually, mm. I think that's a reduction. Um, and I'll tell you why, because when you look at the, so we have this group called the Committee of Union Progress um, in Turkey. The Young Turks. The Young Turks, efficient, yeah. 
Hmm. Um, they were coined the Young Turks by the French. Uh, um, and it's, it's an interesting term, Young Turks, because they use that term even in the British Parliament when, when people in the conservative backbenches are like rebelling against the government, right? This idea of these Young Turks having a rebellious nature. Um, hmm. And one of the things that you see about the Young Turks is they're an umbrella movement. They're not actually a, an organized um, band of people. And, but the Committee of Union and Progress, which was the official name, um, was a group of men who became a little bit disenfranchised by the the politics of Abdul Hamid II for various reasons. That included ulama as well. Um, and so there were ulama as part of of this yeah. Movement. So what people I always tell them they probably they probably weren't clear on what they wanted, but they were clear on what they didn't want, which was Abdul Hamid II. Right. And really. I think. The reason why I mention it in that way is because sometimes when you see some of the things that happen in the so-called Arab Spring, um, those sort of like what we would call revolutionary moments where people know who they don't want in power. They won't want him out. Mm. Okay, but what do you want? Mm. And that lack of clarity can create issues because going forward, um, you know, um, revolutions are messy and going forward, like there's going to be a counter-revolution. People, you know, get rounded up and then it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an extreme negotiation with power. And you get um, multiple actors that jockey in for position and whoever makes it to the top at that moment makes it to the top. And that's similar in the sense of the Young Turk Revolution that happens in 1908. But they do have a rhetorical device, at least, which is that they want a constitution. So that's the argument they put forward. They, then the, the revolution in 1908 was not anti-Islamic, by the way, because all the language was Islamic. And you wouldn't have said that the Young Turks were secularists or nationalists or anti-Islam in any shape or form. So an example is Ruhi al-Khalidi, who's a, an Arab, writes in his book that this is not a photo, this is an inkilab, meaning this is just a transformation. Because people, were, mm. Muslims would have been very agitated at the idea of having a revolution against Islam, the, the Khalifa, and the Sharia. But it was, and this is why Abdul Hamid was in power for one year, and then removed. So the young Turks are not necessarily, and I wouldn't say, the majority, I think they were still religious. Now you could you could second guess the religiosity of each particular individual, but that's a that's another argument uh, about the, mm. the religious nature of any given person, whether they were praying five times a day or not. But the machinery yeah. or the umbrella, um, and I think the umbrella is a better term than machinery, um, which included ulama, were more interested in um, maintaining Islam, and so. That type of discursive continuity until the Turkish Republic is a bit more trickier to um, to substantiate. But that's the narrative, which is that these young Turks bring in this idea of Turkishness, Turkish nationalism, and then by the time you get to 24, of course, of course it makes sense. Now, there are remnants of Turkish Turkification policies, and hmm. most historians now would make the argument that those Turkification policies had two main strategies. One was to centralize the state in which Turkish or Ottoman Turkish at the time would have been the official language of the state. And as a result, they were trying to make sure that Arab elites and bureaucrats also knew Ottoman Turkish. In the Arab provinces, there was a concern of this because for, for long periods, they had a level of cultural autonomy. And this is a period of the, when the Nahda is taking place. And so they, they, they struck back towards Istanbul, saying we're not satisfied with this. And, you know, we have concerns that this will create an environment in which we as Arabs may lose our cultural heritage and identity. Sloppy historians assume that that was an indication that the Young Turks in particular, because they're called the Young Turks, and once again, like I said, they were called that from the outside, were Turkifying mm. the Arab provinces to turn everyone into a Turk. And this is where you see the emergence of the Turkish nationalism. But Turkish nationalism, Arab nationalism, Albanian nationalism, is a response to the collapse of the empire because Muslims were not calling for nationalism. That was very consistent. And you see in the works of many ulama, like Mustafa Sabri, like Mehmed Akif and so forth, who were so anti-nationalism, but were pro-Ottomanism as this like umbrella yeah. patriotism. And so in that sense, there has to be a distinction made, and I'm trying to make this, between the Young Turks and the Kemalist movement that emerges in 22. Right. Okay. Now let's go back to Sultan Abdul yeah. Hamid for a second. So, 
Uh, he becomes a Khalifa in 1876, right. I think it is. Yeah. And uh, he is removed from power in 1908. So he's got, it's a long yeah. reign and uh, he's able to uh, to resist. And, and in, in some respects, I mean, I've been reading some of Eugene Rogan's works and his argument is that during Abd Hamid's reign, uh, there was uh, the 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 pre the preceding one hundred years prior to him coming to to office was a very tumultuous time for the Muslim Ummah and uh, many parts North Africa and many parts of the Russians had taken Crimea and many parts of the uh, the the uh, the greater uh, Caliphate were were being uh, were being um, uh, colonized by European powers and in particular Russia had its designs upon the Muslim Ummah but. Abd Hamid II managed to keep, at least for that period, some form of unity, and there wasn't any sizable uh, annexation right. away from uh, the, the, uh, the, the Islamic Caliphate. Now, um, first, I suppose my first question is, why were people angry with Abd Hamid II, even though he, in a way, stabilized uh, this um, uh, period of... of um, annexation of, of Muslim lands. All right, so first point here is we're looking at this purely from a political perspective. Human beings don't think like that from the day-to-day. -day. The day-to-day -day person who's, who's, who's living, the layman who's living their life, he's not thinking about the possibility of the empire collapsing or the, the politics of, you know, um, the encroachment of the colonial powers. What they're thinking about is taxation. What they're thinking about is usually the considerations are local in terms of what's happening to so somebody in Damascus is oblivious to the, what's happening to somebody in Sarajevo. Now, what you have in this particular moment is because of the printing press, or, um, the possibility of creating an imagination beyond the, the boundaries of your local vicinity. And so people can mm. actually start to realize what it means to belong to this, you know, greater state in that sense, including Muslims in India. Now, in the case of Abdul Hamid, um, just like, and this is one of the things I want to stress about the idea of empire and how it works, or in the Khilafah as well, is that it's a series of negotiation with a series of actors across the board. And the type mm. of negotiation you may have in one part of your domain may be very different than the type of negotiation you would have in another part of your domain. And this is why, although mm. many Muslims might not watch Game of Thrones or these types of shows, like these world building shows, but one of the things you do see about the intrigue of this sort of like our historic, no, this historical fiction series, even though it's got dragons in it, is the idea that it's continual needs of negotiations, continual needs of multiple players coming in for various reasons, generational shifts, um, shifts in types of politics and so on. And what Abdul Hamid skillfully did, and I think Rogan has shown in his work, but he's not the only one. I think there's Firoz Yasami has a book on Ottoman diplomacy is balancing not only the foreign powers, but balancing the various actors within the empire to maintain his authority. But it was a tricky business at a time where nationalism in at least the, the sort of like Christian areas was becoming more prevalent. It was a time where modernity was not a one-size-fits-all. It was a time where there was multiple wars and he had to pay debts. And he did the best that he could in, in, in that capacity, but it was tricky. Um, and in the end, when the guy's been in power for 30 years and he's just keeping it stable, one of the intriguing things about the Young Turks, which people don't appreciate, is they were front foot. They said, we don't want to be static and stable. We want to go back to glory days. What their mm -hmm. idea was, and we, we need to go get everything back, you know, in that sense. Um, and, you know, I joke about it with my students all the time. They're almost similar to Trump of trying to make the empire great again, you know, in that sense. And that rhetoric, it, it resonated with people. Um, with the ulama, mm. they had various other problems with Abdul Hamid in the sense of it. They were, they were frustrated with the parallel educational systems that were being created. The way, so for example, the madrasa system no, no longer was able to facilitate things like translation and, and military needs and technological needs and so forth. And so mm. one of the concerns that the ulama had was that their institution, um, to some degree, was not getting the type of treatment that they felt it should have got. And Abdul Hamid was just very pragmatic in the way that he was dealing with these policies. And then there was the heavy censorship that took place within works and books, which were critical of Abdul Hamid. And some of the ulama were frustrated that the sort of freedom of, 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 of thinking that they were permitted in Islam. And this is another thing that people need to understand, that 
we do have a concept of freedom of thought within the Islamic um, intellectual context was also being diminished um, to maintain this power, to maintain the stability, to maintain the security. And so as a result, it, it all came to a head. And that was the, the, the explosion moment. And so that's how I think people need to understand it. Because usually they, they see people moving against Abdul Hamid as some form of, like, these guys are traitors and so on. But it was complicated. Mm. And until people understand right. the mechanizations of the whole empire, I don't think they'll appreciate the various different reasons of why people were moving against him. I mean, what part did um, the West play in inciting nationalism first within uh, the European territories of, uh, of the Ottomans, like Bulgaria and in the Balkans, for example, uh, but also inspiring nationalism within uh, the Muslim community, within it wasn't uh, just, Turkey and in it the It wasn't countries. just nationalism that they were agitating. They were agitating ideas of an alternative caliphate, um, which is very right. consistent. And, and you see that. Um, now, there were people like Sheikh Rashid Rinda, for example, who believed that um, in an ideal world, the caliphate should belong to somebody who's from the house of the Quraysh, right? Um, mm. It's unfair to lump him in with the rest of the um, pro-Arab caliphate thinkers who were being encouraged by the British to some degree. Uh, but even then, you could see that while the British were trying to create this propaganda that the caliphate should be in the house of, in the hands of the Arabs, not in Istanbul, even someone like Sharif Hussein was really hesitant to make that claim because they were aware of, of the consequences and they were aware yeah. that, um, you know, this empire is going to be here forever. That was, was the feeling, right? Now, the nationalism, especially in the Balkan, um, were being agitated mainly because of um, this, this idea that how can you be under the rulership of Muslims and so forth. We don't see that yeah. similar type of nationalism um, from Muslims. So in the case of Muslims, whether it's Arab nationalism, Turkish nationalism, or like I said, Albanian nationalism, and so on, you don't see it. This is why some historians are trying to make this distinction between Arabism as a particular um, historical, cultural, and even political renaissance in which Arabs wanted a decentralized Ottoman Empire that, where they had more autonomy, more room to maneuver, um, more local governance, that wasn't coming from a centralized system. And the Ottomans have had a history of that. Um, and that Arabism by World War I translates or discursively becomes Arab nationalism as the empire is collapsing. And then the Arab nationalists get some sort of traction because they get support by the British who are constructing the nation states, right? So yeah. the thing is, is there's a blur here. The possibility is, is that that, that Arabism does have a sort of basis in which it provides agency to Arab nationalism. But at the same time, if the Ottoman Empire would have survived, it could have swung in another direction in which it could have just uh, meant having some level of autonomy and still having the hierarchy in which Istanbul is the center. And I think Eugene Rogan mentions this, and it was uh, it, he echoes uh, something you said in a previous show that if the First World War went the way of the Ottomans, uh, we would still be fearing the Ottomans today. He's, he's talking about the West. And, you know, the Ottomans had that longevity. Uh, it, it was really down to the First World War. Can you, can you expand on that? What, what, what impact did the war have on, uh, on well, the, the war, Ottoman state? The war is seismic in the sense that a lot of Muslims internalized the idea that the Ottomans were on these, like, you know, three, four hundred year decliners down here. And what's interesting yeah. is the decline is is spoken of within the Muslim imagination from the time of Suleiman the Magnificent in which, you know, they stop at the gates of Vienna. The reason why I have, I have a concern about that first from a Muslim perspective is because it seems to suggest the minute the Ottomans became a caliphate, it's all downhill. So on the one hand, mm. you're trying to promote the idea of the necessity of the caliph, right? and then you make unknowingly the argument is put forward that the minute this entity becomes a caliph, it's downhill. So how are people going to resonate with that? They're not going to be able to make sense of that. What we see yeah. is um, more interestingly is cycles, right? The Ottomans, where they, what they're good at is reinventing themselves continuously in these, these cycles of, um, and what, what we see is, and the reason why I'm saying these cycles is because you see Sunnism continuously being um, fight moments of like re Sunniizing re society in different generations. Yes. Which, it, so mm -hmm. it's not a straight line. And you see this in works of Ottoman history. In the 19th century, for all its problems, 
is seeing an upward curve, actually, rather than a downward curve. So the idea of the Nahta, the idea of the printed press, the idea of uh, literacy, the idea of um, improved um, military, um, they were on the upward curve. And then you get to this junction point, which is an extraordinary war, um, more seismic than the Mongol invasion. And it just absolutely decimates not only the Ottomans, but everything around it. It was collateral. And, you know, that's what I think we need to re-examine in that sense, that the assumption is, and because we think, or we become to us, we've, we start to be sort of like trained into thinking within paradigms. And for us, these, these, these paradigms, they, they fit well, they're easy. There's no granular um, research that needs to be done. And we just think, you know, it goes up and then it goes down. And whereas mm. here, that was not what was happening. It was, there were, these moments are going round and round until you got to a point where they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time in history. Yeah, but yet even prior to the First World War, the Ottomans ha had, in effect, been, become economically bankrupt. Uh, I think prior yeah. to Abdul Hamid II coming to yeah. office, the Ottomans uh, had, uh, had, uh, had, had, in effect, become a bankrupt state. Um, we've yeah. talked about the territories that for the last hundred years prior, to, you know, in the in the 19th century, uh, the, you know, bits of territory were taken away from the Ottomans. Uh, there was a an un there was a, a restlessness within uh, the Ottoman Caliphate, partly down to the emergence of great European yeah. powers um, who had now uh, who had developed uh, new ways by which they could arm themselves right. and and develop technology. And the Ottomans looked backwards in in that sense. And, and I think the Ottomans were called the the sick man of Europe, even at you know during the nineteenth century. Now, how much of that? would contribute to that ultimate Ottoman decline post-First World War? Um, some of it is true, some of it not so much. I mean, I'll give you an example. Mm. I'm in the United States of America at the moment, and it feels like everything is yeah. falling apart at the seams. It really does, <laughs> but it's empire. It, yeah. But it feels like empire when I'm here as well. You, it feels different. Yeah. You know, how does a person in Alaska resonate with somebody in Florida? Or how does a person mm. in New York make sense of somebody in Texas? But when you're around, yeah. everyone's complaining, everyone's whinging, and when I look at the US in terms of the metro system and so forth. I've been to other parts of the world where they're far more efficient, where they're far more streamlined and so on, right? And this is mm -hmm. the, the idea. So how do you make sense of the continued changing conditions of empire in terms of its height and its weakness? I mean, the peak moments, I guess, we could, we could easily argue about, but the, the in-between moments are the parts that are a little bit harder. In the case of the Ottomans, mm -hmm. Um, technologically, they'd closed the gap. Intellectually, they'd closed the gap. Yes, they had lost some territory, but the 19th century saw Sudan become part of the Ottoman Empire, Yemen become part of the Ottoman Empire. These were, you know, and India for the first time, Muslims in India were fetishizing about the Ottoman past, which hadn't happened during the Mughal period. So there was various different right. things that were taking place. And the Ottomans, there was a scramble for Africa from the Ottomans by using different strategies. There was Muslims from Malaysia to Indonesia coming to Istanbul. Looking at Istanbul as a possible model of survival. So you're right, there are some mm. easy moments that we can see where the Ottomans clearly were having trouble, and that gave the West a particular advantage. But if we were to look at the British Empire, and if we were to look at the Russian Empire, there were similar arguments being made. The British were at their height mm. in 1922 in the Arab world, and by 1944 45, they lost the empire and had to downscale to the Commonwealth. And India was gone. And how mm. does that happen? You know, where was the rise and fall? Where was the decline? Did anyone not see it? So what you realize is World War II is another car crash moment. Um, and you see that in the case of the French, the emergence of the United States of America. And if you read the history of Russia, it's no different in many ways to the Ottoman Empire. Um, and you, you have the Bolshevik Revolution. The difference is, I would mm. say, is that these nations... They, they still exist, they're still here, and they were able to fashion and write their history in a particular way where they didn't write a decline narrative in their history. They still right. wrote that part as a way of celebration. The Ottoman Empire collapses and you have the Turkish Republic and all the other uh, nation states, and we have a sense of self-deprecation where we write in a way of saying that that was a, a useless past and that la those last hundred years were a mess, um, even though all those nation states were then using especially the Turkish Republic, the institutions of the Ottoman Empire is a way of surviving. 
And if you look at Turkey as a model right now, um, it still sits on that historical past in comparison to the Arab provinces and the Balkans. And one could say, if you wanted to argue that point, is that it's probably the most successful nation state um, in a area where every other nation state, I would argue, hasn't succeeded in a nation state model. Mm, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, there is also the argument, and I think Bernard Lewis uh, mentions this, and we had a very long discussion about yeah. Bernard Lewis, and you, uh, you discussed some of his some of the problems in his writing. But I think there's a little bit of it uh, when uh, even Eugene Rogan talks about this that the Ottoman state had to negotiate modernity, or at least yeah. Western modernity, and um, uh, there was a lot of resistance within the Ottomans towards that modernity and. Uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid yeah. II um, was uh, also part of that that mm -hmm. debate, and um, in many ways he was trying to filter for the good from the yeah. bad. Um, and uh, the narrative goes that the nationalists realized that the Ottomans were just not doing enough, not embracing enough of modernity yeah. to keep the empire going, and that's partly why uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid had to fall. I mean, how how do you understand this debate about? Islam and modernity, Islam and let's call it liberalism yeah. or secularism. Yeah. Um, how does how does that debate fit into this whole discussion about the Ottoman? Well, form? today, if you spoke to Muslim thinkers today, they would say that you know Islam and modernity are just okay. That's a mistake. So, it, mm. so when the Ottomans are trying to negotiate with this with lived reality of the world changing around them, do you blame them? Because in actuality, like mm. whole scale modernity is. It's 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 just beyond comprehension in many ways, right? And here I agree with Halak. I agree with Halak on a lot of points actually. But here, where he says that modernity has a caustic component to it, right? Which is not written mm. in the history books. It has a violent component to it, which is not written in the history books. And in that sense, the Ottomans are, on the one hand, not just the Ottomans, many intellectuals and elites within the Ottoman Empire. You see it in their works. They have an admiration to specific parts of modernity particular parts of progress. This is why the Committee and Union and Progress, that's what they call themselves, right? But there are particular components of modernity which they just cannot subscribe to. So the question is, is that how do you try to fashion yourself in that type of world? And they were trying to do that. And I think that they were at a moment, it's, I always say it's like my club Liverpool, where you've got mm -hmm. like, you know, different teams around you who've got billionaire owners you know, fixing their teams and you have a particular model that you use and you have these blip moments, you know, you're successful, you win the league, you win the Champions League and then this season you're, you're struggling at 10, but you have a good manager who can get you through it and then next season, the methodologies you, the negotiations you have with the, the things around you and you go again and I think the Ottomans were capable of doing that. It's just that um, we got to stop seeing history in straight lines, right? So um, in that sense, there were a lot of challenges that modernity brought. Modernity came into the Ottoman domains via the Christians of the Ottoman Empire, uh, or the non-Muslims of the Ottoman Empire predominantly. Uh, modernity came into the Ottoman Empire in a, ve in a different form via the Muslim elites. Modernity came into the Ottoman Empire because of technological reasons. And the Ottoman Empire was modernizing in various parts of the empire in different ways. Um, it was a uniform em form of modernity, so Istanbul, is a very different modern city than Cairo or Beirut. And then there's huge areas of nomadic areas in conservative areas mm. where they're not interested in modernity. They, they don't care. And so that's the complexity the Ottomans have, which is that, and then you have the emergence of the reformist movements, the Salafiya movements, the Naqshbandis as well, um, and the Wahhabi movement. It was a particular form of reform that they had in mind. And all of these various movements, to some degree, reflect modernity. And to some degree, are anti-modern modernists. You know what I mean, in that sense, and that's what's intriguing here, and that's what they're dealing with. Um, and I think that Muslims and Islam and us today are continuously going to be navigating and negotiating with the complexities of this phenomena, which we've given a name to, which is modernity. Hmm. I want to understand what led the Ottomans to support the Germans uh, in the First World War. I mean, my understanding is that the Ottomans did not have a, a dog in mm -hmm. the fight. Um, you know, the war had nothing to do with them. Yes, of course, 
the the war began uh, in Sarajevo, or at least the the trigger for the conflict began in Sarajevo. But Sarajevo had been portioned off to the Austro-Hungarians way before uh, before the the 20th century, and so we've now got the Ottomans having to make a decision right. uh, to join the sides in the conflict. They had a previous relationship with Britain, or at least the the Brits had a policy way back in the 19th century to maintain the coherency of the Ottoman state as a bulwark against uh, Russia. Um, So what went through the Ottomans' mind to join uh, the Axis forces in in this conflict? To a particular degree, while they didn't have, as you said, they didn't have uh, a need to be in it, but to another degree, they had no choice in some so you, I always mm. explain to people, for the Ottomans, World War I doesn't start in 1914. The Italian invasion of Libya in 1911, it, it, right. that's when it starts for them. And then the two Balkan wars in 1912, 1913 for the Ottomans, and the Russians are heavily involved in that, that, that agitation. So the Ottomans are aware that the Russian threat is not going away. The Russian threat is on their border and is here and is now. They do try to negotiate yeah. with the Brits and the French, and people will say, why are they going to the British and the French? Who else can they go to? You can't go to another mm. Muslim country. They will colonize. So in that sense, you can't. You have no allies from the Muslim world. And the idea of going to the British and the French was not about being involved in the war. It was about having what you would call political treaties so that the cost of war by one nation would have been too risky to go to war for. So if the mm. Ottomans had, had an alignment with the British, then the Russians would have fought twice about going to war with the Ottomans because it would have meant there would have been consequences regarding the British. And the Ottomans tried that. So the idea of negotiating with the Germans was for that reason. It wasn't the idea of going to war. The idea was that the Germans may go to war with the Russians, but the Ottomans would be like a, a buffer where the Russians would not encroach because, you know, you don't want to go in direct conflict with your neighbor. And the war would have been, you know, fundamentally between the Russians and, and, and the Germans. Now, where the Ottomans got caught off guard a little bit, is they didn't anticipate that the, the Germans had different intention and they invaded the French, which caught it. That, that changed the complexity of everything because uh, an invasion mm. of France was also an invasion of Britain. And so then the British and the French got involved in the war. And then the Ottomans were under the impression, and rightly so, because there was no precedent for this, which is just like Libya in 1911 and the Balkan Wars in 1912 and 13, that this will be a one year, two year smashing grab. And we'll see what we can get and we'll see what we'll lose. Instead, it went on for a decade. And I don't think people appreciate this, that a war of, a war of trenches for 10 years for virtually every na- major power in the world um, is taxing. And people don't people get tired of fighting. People get exhausted. Like It's not the days of bother, you know, where you just go out, a group of you, and you go fighting. This is, uh, this is the long haul. And maintaining that type of motivation, and the reason why I'm explaining about because if you see in the Battle of Mota, there are Muslims who need motivation to go out and fight, because there's a nerve in them. How do you maintain yeah. a level of motivation for this type of warfare for 10 years on a society that's been battered? That was tough. And I don't think the Ottomans or we Muslims have thought about that in terms of how do you do that? And in the end, it, you know, there's a generational shift. There's a whole generation within the war who are not going to school, who are not going to madrasa, who are not learning about Islam. They're just fighting. And it's that next generation who have a sort of like um, whole gap in their emotion and imagination about what it means um, to belong to this entity, which were exploited into establishing another system. You know, and many great thinkers died in the first part of the war as well. Mm. So if I may summarize your argument um, so far, you argue that uh, there was uh, no sense of linear decline. It was the First World War that was the car crash. If it wasn't for that war, the Ottomans who who had the capacity within them uh, to renew themselves, and they were trying to renew themselves throughout the the, the century prior, um, the Ottomans faced uh, the types of uh, challenges that all states and all empires face, whether that's yeah. economic challenges, social yeah. challenges, or, or otherwise. Uh, and it was the unfortunate um, choice, I suppose, or decision to join with the Germans, um, because the Ottomans calculated that the Russians were the greatest threat to them. And so by joining with the Germans, uh, they could uh, develop an alliance against the Russians and keep Istanbul safe from, uh, from, colon- from uh, colonial forces mm-hmm. from, from Russia. 
So that's that's your your basic your basic argument. Uh, but of course, these internal uh, eruptions right. happen uh, after the First World right. War. The nationalists are now in power. Right. They strip the Ottomans, uh, the Ottoman ruling family at least, uh, from uh, its political and, and legislative duties. Uh, what then is the reason to remove the caliphate two years later in 1924? I mean, Surely that relationship, if Abdul Majid II uh, is in effect a symbol yeah. and uh, doesn't have any political or legislative power, why go that extra step and remove the caliphate con completely from, uh, from, from Turkey, from the modern Turkish Republic and establish a modern Turkish Republic? It's an interesting point. I mean, like, look, the first part of your question about there being a linear decline, I mean, I, I'm not one of those who's just going to blindly say there wasn't a decline here. Mm. That, I mean, in comparison to I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years before, this is a very different empire. And there are, right. there are aspects of that empire which are, I think there are unfair things, firstly, before I answer your question, to compare it to Suleiman the Magnificent, is what I'm saying is unfair, right? In mm. that sense. Mm. And in comparison to the British and French, you would have to say that the Ottomans, you know, the British and the French are at the top of the league and the Ottomans are mid-table. That's fine. Um, but my, my point I guess I'm trying to make is that you don't need this gradual decline for things to come bust, right? That um, you don't, because this is what people are continuously waiting for, this moment that, you, you know, you decline and you end. I mean, I've said this before, the, the, the Ottomans even collapse in it. There's a Quranic injunction that nothing survives forever. And I think as Muslims, we have to mm. be aware of that, that if the Ottomans were here till the end of time, you know, how do we make sense of that? So in that sense, it's inevitable that one day Allah Ta'ala has he saw fit will do what he saw fit. Um, but what's interesting now answering your question, um, in the case of the Ottomans, the Turkish Republic fundamentally this, this emerges from the, the contestation between the two governments, right? So during World War I, when the Istanbul government, when Istanbul was occupied by the uh, British and the French and the Italians and the Greeks, that they had heavily compromised the decision-making process of the Khilafah, the Caliphate system in Islam. And they had made a series of mm. concessions um, to the foreign powers as a way of maintaining the integrity of the Khilafah to the detriment of the landmass, which is known as Anatolia. And then you mm. have the Grand National Assembly, who are the military men who establish an independent government in Ankara as a way of continuing the war of independence as a struggle fundamentally against the Greeks and Italians to um, establish what we'd call modern day Turkey. And their idea was, was that if they hadn't continued to fight that fight, then the Caliphate would have uh, given up and left us as a shell in comparison to what we have become today, right? So there is an agitation mm -hmm. towards the decision makers in Istanbul. There's an agitation towards the symbol of what the Khilafah is. And there's an agitation towards it being an, an, an entity which um, Muslims around the world are, are having some level of agency over, especially the Muslims in India who frustrated um, Ismet Inanu um, in the Treaty of Lausanne, which was supposed to be a response to the Treaty of Sevres. And the only reason why the Treaty of Lausanne was possible is because of the success of the, um, the people who were pro-Republic. Um, in that sense, and they felt that they had a more of a say in terms of how the nation should be run. And so when Muslims in India are pestering them at the Treaty of Lausanne, in particular, the two envoys that were sent to Lausanne by the Khilafat Committee was the Aga Khan and Amir Ali, who were not even fully mm. Muslims. It's kind of jarring. Mm. Some people don't realize that moment in history as well, right? So mm. for the Turkish Republic, there's two things that they're having a problem with, or the Kemalists in, in, in Ankara now. One, they have a particular agitation of, about the way that we got into, they got into the war. Two, they have a particular imagination that, listen, um, as a way of going forward, we're going to have to um, buy into the idea of what the European powers are doing in terms of separation of religion from state. Three, you know, um, we have a problem with the caliph and his supporters in Istanbul. They've made, and the people that made the decision were not Abdul Majid II, by the way, or Vahdin's cabinet, mm. we call him. 
these people made particular uh, concessions at the Treaty of Severus. And, uh, you know, we cannot allow them and the supporters of the Kele um, to, to safeguard the future of this country based on the decision-making process they made before. Now, what's intriguing is many of the war heroes um, who were in the Grand National Assembly were pro caliphate And so there was also an internal contestation between the various military men in terms of how to go forward. And so Abdul Majid, although was symbolic, there was a fear that those military men who were equal heroes to Mustafa Kemal, like Khaji Karabek and so forth, would support the Khalifa, institutionalize him again as a Khalifa, and as a military junta would support him, um, similar to the way that we have like the military support in the King of Jordan, and reinstitutionalize the Caliphate to the detriment of the, of, of the republic that they've established. And so there's multiple layers to this, and this is what the thinking was behind it. And they went for broke, and they said, you know what? I mean, their, their narratives, I don't know how true this is, but you do read narratives that even Mustafa Kemal thought about becoming caliph. And then he said, in an attorney around, said, no, we should, let's just go down the, the route of it being a republic. There are other narratives and theories that the British themselves, one of the conditions or the hidden conditions at, at Lausanne was to turn this into a republic. And there are some people who believe that. I personally haven't seen the evidence for that. But once again, that wouldn't be too far-fetched in, in warlike conditions. So... Um, hmm. The reasons they had were many um, in, in their mindset. Um, now, Muslims would disagree with that, those reasons, but that's their thought process. Now, the fall of the caliphate reverberated across the Muslim world, and I understand there were a number of projects and conferences that were established uh, or convened to, uh, to try to renew the caliphate or at least to appoint a caliph uh, because uh, Muslims saw it as a an obligation and a duty to uh, to have this institution. Uh, so I know of uh, a conference that took place in Egypt, a caliphate conference. Uh, there was a conference in Jerusalem in 1931, and even in Indonesia in 1924. Um, do you know? Do you have information about uh, these conferences? Who attended and what came of of them? What were their, what were there? You know, but you're really biting my brain today. <laughs> no, oh, sorry. <laughs> so okay. This is really interesting. So we should like rewind back and go to the Khilafic Committee. So for those of your viewers who don't know who the Khilafic Committee are, so this was yeah. not during World War One, but during the War of Independence, right? So World War One, technically for the Ottomans anyway, um, ends in 1918 at the loss of the Arab provinces and so forth. But the, the War of Independence, which is between 1919 to 1924 in the Turkish Republic, is continuing, and um, in India we start to see the emergence of a movement. Um, which is supporting the war of independence um, in the hope that um, the, they still saw it as the Ottomans, that the Ottomans would be successful and that the Khilafah would mm. remain. And this establishment by uh, Abdul Bari, Ali Johar, and his brother, uh, Molana Kalam Azad, or as they used to call him in the Ottoman Empire, Hijazi Kalam Azad, and so on. Now, these people uh, in particular who were imprisoned during World War I as a way of not creating an environment to support the Ottomans. Um, agitated for um, a movement to support the Ottoman Empire by having a series of protests, discussions, debates, and so forth within India uh, disrupt, in an attempt to disrupt the British, right? And this is interesting, why? Because at the same time, the British have got Muslim soldiers in the British army who are fighting in various places or whatnot, right? Now, there's also a complexity in India because you have the Nizam of Hyderabad who held a neutral position, by the way. People don't realize this because they see the famous picture of the the marriage that takes place. But during this moment, he holds an absolute neutral position because he doesn't want to get involved because he, he's not sure what the outcome is going to be. So this is the person who's... The deal, but in particular, we're not, it, even amongst the ulama, there's various positions in India because they, do, they really don't know what's happening in the Ottoman Empire. They, you know, so they mm. said, listen, we need to keep it in-house local. We don't want to pick a side because you know, God knows what's going to happen there and then what will happen to us in that sense. As, as we percussions, we have to be careful. And so there's various feelings and emotions towards that. Um, but when the Ottoman Empire collapses, it's a huge shock to the system. Like, what just happened here? And what's interesting is, it's not when the Turkish Republic abolishes the Ottoman Caliphate, it simultaneously also kills the Khilafat Committee movement and the momentum that's obtained in India as a way of being um, 
you know, um, resisting the British. Another interesting thing for the Khilafic Committee, and people say this is when Gandhi got involved in the Khilafic Committee. Because on the one hand, people thought, or well, Gandhi felt at least, that this is momentum against the British. But the people of the Khilafic Committee were making the argument that the Muslims no longer know what this movement is about anymore. It's become blurry. So anyway, when they abolished the Turkish Republic, two birds with one stone. The committee is done. The Republic is, is here. The Ottoman Empire is gone. But then you see that someone like Abdul Razik, for example, Sheikh Abdul Razik in Egypt, write this book that the Khilafat is not necessary. And you see the Ulama mm. of Azhar saying, what are you talking about? And he literally gets ostracized. by saying, you, you can't say that. Um, you then have Sheikh Mustafa Sabri Effendi write a book, which, to be honest, is quite messy in, in, when you're trying to read it. I think it's just him trying to publish something as fast as he could about the necessity of the mm. Khilafat, the Khilafat being formed and whatnot. So he, he was the former, the last Sheikh He wasn't Islam. the last Sheikh Islam, but the proper, hmm. who you would call Sheikh Islam. There was one, like, I heard of Herullah Fendi, I think his name was, uh, it may, hmm. well, I'm sorry if, I, if I'm wrong, my, my memory is not yeah. certainly great, but there was another Sheikh Islam that comes after him. Okay. But um, yeah. they call him the last true Sheikh Islam, the one who had some level of agency of, of making the book. Um, he, he put out hmm. a quick book in 24, saying that the Khilafah was formed and so forth, right? And also complained about the Kemalists and going to town on the ulama in Egypt by saying, you know, you were celebrating these guys, I was warning you. Um, and so what you see is there is a, a particular emotion of many people who have been stunned by what's happened in Istanbul. Mm. Um, but they don't have any political authority. And so what they try to do after the collapse of the Ottoman is Abdul Majid is still alive to use him as a, as a symbol, as a way of trying to find ways of reviving it in other places. But where would you house them? They tried it in Egypt, but under British occupation, um, they go to Palestine, but they say the Imam of Palestine is a lot more pragmatic, is more interested in, in saving goods um, and not getting involved in this question because they don't have any sort of like political backing for it. And then obviously the yeah. famous wedding between the, the son of the Nizam of Hyderabad and Abdul Majid's daughter. Uh, but it was too late. It was too late. They did miss the boat, yeah. in fact. I remember reading something from Ali Johar, who says really something interesting. He goes, in the Jerusalem conference, he said, um, you know, um, we were more Turk than the Turk and more Arab than the Arab. We understood them, <laughs> but they never understood us in India. You know, and you yeah. can see that to some degree how, in that sense, news and information gives you a particular perception of being connected to other people around the world. But it also highlights the sense of distance that people have. That while you have a perception that may give you an attachment to somebody, but if you don't understand what's happening on the granular level, on the political level, in terms of what's happening in any given space and time, um, you're bound to make mistakes as a consequence of that. And I'll make the same argument for Muslims today who love to go on social media and sort of like shout about knowing what's happening around the world and having an opinion about what every other Muslim should be doing or ought to be doing. You're not really understanding that when you're in a given place, that on the ground level, there are a lot of complexities and differences. And, actual, and actually, we're not as closely connected as we think we are, but we are emotionally connected and spiritually connected in a way that other communities are not. And that's the uniqueness about understanding that. Yeah. Dr. Yakub, in the final few minutes, I want to understand Dr. Uh, Sheikh Al-Islam Mustafa yeah. Sabri because uh, in a conversation I had with you off camera, we, you talk about uh, Mustafa Sabri became a, a, a proponent of the caliphate um, and, and um, he ends up in Egypt, in Cairo, yeah. right? And he dies in Cairo. So just, just give us a summary of, of uh, what Mustafa Sabri did after, his, uh, after he was removed from or he left uh, well, Sabri's an exceptional thinker, and I, I've made that case. Yeah. I've said this before. That I, I collected so much data on, on, on wanting to write his biography and then just felt that mm. I was too young to write it. Uh, I, I couldn't give him that sort of right. respect that he deserved. Um, and so I've got this data sitting in my library, but I just, um, yeah, I may also like, give me some more years so that I can sit down and, and be fair I to mean. him. But I mean, this is a phenomenal person yeah. who... He's born in a village in Tokat, becomes a librarian of Sultan Abdul Hamid II. So he's doing halakha of Sultan Abdul Hamid. Then gets involved in the Young Turk Revolution against Abdul Hamid. You know, and right. facilitates the idea of constitutionalism. He's pushing the idea for that. He's a parliamentarian, he's a journalist. Who then, during World War I, 
and then becomes Sheikh al Islam, right, during World War One. And then various moments in exile there was a Turkish teacher for in a Greek monastery in Greece, uh, goes to Romania, ends up in Beirut, goes to Jeddah, and then ends up in Egypt twice. And he's last in, in Egypt. He's a teacher in the Azhar, who, from what I understand, was very frustrated um, in Egypt regarding the ulama, very frustrated at what happened to the Ottoman Empire, very angry. Alhamdulillah, he wasn't despondent, you know? And I say this to my students, that as Muslims, we can't be despondent. Like, we, you have to have optimism and hope. So although he's frustrated, angry, and bitter, he's still producing ideas um, in the hope that um, somewhere down the line in the future, uh, something can come out of it. And, and does anyone listen? Um, there's something really interesting thing. So I'll give an example. I've said this before on one of the podcasts, which is he's first writing about mm-hmm. a constitutional caliphate. He then downgrades to just saving the, the caliphate of the caliphate. He then downgrades to just saving Athida. So you can see how he's seen it. In Egypt, when he's writing, there are many ulama who do take him seriously at the time. I mean, when he's writing his work, it's known that Hassel Banna, for example, this is all tradition, was facilitating and supporting him. I give an example. I've said this before that I wouldn't, you, you can't say that Sheikh Taqad in Bahani wasn't inspired by him. Why? Because the ideas are very similar. Mustafa Sabri dies in 53. His Mutahri is established in 53. Um, you mm. have to say, okay, what's going on here? Um, Andrew Hammond has a book on the Egyptian ulama who went to, I mean, it says oh, Istanbul ulama, or the ones in Anatolia who went to Egypt. I haven't read the book yet, so I don't know uh, how much information is in there to tell us what that happened. Mm. I mean, I know from my own reading that his impact on the ground was sizable um, in, in that sense, but history didn't remember him. Because there was a particular moment that when somebody dies, you have Gamal Abdel Nasser's revolution, so-called revolution, or whatever you want to call it. And then as a result of that, people like him went by the wayside. And then people like Qutub were created as, as particular sort of like symbols in of themselves so that that type of thinking can be attacked. Um, and that's where somebody sits in that moment in history, um, you know, in that sense. But he's, he's revered in, in Turkey because... His works, in particular, and he wrote about various things, are still studied. Uh, his politics, people question at times. But what's interesting about him, he's complicated, and he, he reflects the complexity of empire. Because in comparison to, mm. this is a guy who lived in empire and had this full life, and his work reflects what it means to be part of a civilizational empire. And then you have, you know, the Ulema come out of the, the nation state project, and in comparison to what he's writing, it's not of the same quality, I would argue. Every time I speak to you, uh, Dr. Yakub, I get the impression that things are complicated. Yeah. People right. are complicated. Empires yeah. are complicated. It's it's far more nuanced right. and, um, than than what we we make yeah. out. Um, and and maybe that's the that's probably what you get from being a yeah. historian, right? You you get to understand the the grades of sh- uh, the the gray shades. And that's between. why I want to teach it. Like, that's why I want it to be on syllabus. That's why I want it to be in seminaries because I want our people to understand it's complicated. And the minute, you know, like, the minute you understand the complexities, you're, you have a group of people that would have a, a particular intellectual disp- disposition, which I think will be far more conducive to, mm-hmm. to creating a, a world that is something in line with what people achieved in the past. That's my belief. I'm not blowing my own trumpet by saying everyone needs to be a historian. I mean, I don't think history is the most important thing. But I think Quran Sunday is. But I'm just saying we should think about having this on our curricula because I think it, it's important. Maybe one very yeah. last question, uh, Dr. Yakub. Um, uh, the 3rd of March, 1924, 99 years ago today, uh, the Ottoman Caliphate fell. Can we imagine a world with a new caliphate? Can why that not? happen? Why not? It's as simple as that. If you want me to hit over a straight bat, why not? You know, look, um, I know I was raised in a particular generation where I know there are some people that are frustrated with you. I know there are some hmm. people who feel that, um, you know, talking about this all the time should not be the order of the day. There's many more other complexities in the community. I get it. 
they are. I don't think it has to be a zero-sum game. I think it, could be, it doesn't have to be evil or. Um, I know that there is a belief that Muslims are so bogged down with something that the political issues are sidetracking them and, and so on. But if Islam can be informative nowadays when I'm listening to people about the way that we do the environment, if Islam can be informative in the way that we do economics, then I don't see why we have to stop and say Islam can still not be informative in the way that we do our politics. And my deen is a beautiful deen. My, I believe this. My deen has told me to be good to my neighbor. My deen has told me to be a good national citizen in the societies I'm in. My deen tells me to be a good son, a good teacher, a good Muslim. There's no reason why my deen does not have the ability to tell me how to not do my politics well. We have a rich history of that. And I don't feel to some degree, you know, I don't have a complex because of that. I'm comfortable with that. But if you were to tell me is the Khilafah going to happen tomorrow, then right now my answer would be no. But I say, do we have a right to imagine that we want a form of governance which is, you know, influenced by the ethics and morals of Islam? I think so. Because in the end of the day, as a Muslim, I believe in the salvation of humanity. And so I have no hesitation in saying that, you know, inshallah, one day, whatever, whenever the Muslims see fit, they will do what they see fit. And, um, you know, I, I think we should be um, a bit more supportive of the next generation in helping them, trying to grapple with this question, with the various other challenges they had. So I've said this to you before, that the issues of modernity, this is an exceptional moment in history, an exceptional moment in which we may lose Muslims by the wayside. But during exceptional moments and exceptional tests arise exceptional people. And I believe this generation does have the capacity to do that. So whatever Allah wills, Allah wills. Dr. Yaqub Ahmed, as Jazakallah khair for your time today. When you're back in, when you're back in the UK, yeah. Yaqub, uh, we should host a conference on the Inshallah. Ottoman, on the Ottoman Inshallah. Caliphate. Inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.